Hello friends. Uh, today it is my pleasure and honor to welcome my friend Adnan Rashid, also known as Chaudhary. And today I am so excited to welcome welcome him. It's been years that we have been in contact with, and today we are gonna dig deeper into his life and our RMC life together. Adnan, how are you doing? Assalamu alaikum, Fram. I'm doing very well, Alhamdulillah. All the praise is to God. Thank you. Thank God you is very, very kind. Much. Oh, that is the way to start, mashallah. Yeah. I want to ask you, where do you live right now? Where are you? <clears throat> I'm in uh, Melbourne. I've been in Australia since 2003. I moved from um, back home here directly and then just stayed here. Wow. I want to say that uh, this has been a quite a journey uh, all of us when we left our country most of us left the country for the first time i had never been out of the country but the, when i was leaving i was leaving for good and i think uh, for, it applies to most of us that when we l got education in pakistan and we were looking for a better future we found our paths and your your path took you to australia how did you decide about australia and not america or england I think it's on, if I go back, uh, um, I did my training in anesthesia in PIMS. Okay. Um, so I was doing anesthesia there. And then um, at that stage, my sister, you remember my older sister, Shazia. Shazia, yeah. She, yeah, she moved to Australia um, for good. And then she paved the way for us, which is my elder brother, Asif. So he came before me and then I followed. Um, so it was, the idea was cooking that, um, because when she moved, she's the first drop of the rain. She doesn't know where she's going. She's never left the country before. And then when she came here, she praised it, the place and the work and everything. And it's all um, her efforts that she persuaded us that this is better. Um, to come here and um, follow your dreams and that's how this is all written in uh, the faith yeah so uh, that's what that that's where we're here i i have to tell you that um that speaks highly of how your parents raised you how your parents raised all of you because you know i have seen many many families where if one gets out they become selfish about their own lives and forget about what, who are behind. But it tells you how strong bond you guys have together as a family and how um, good your uh, upbringing was. So I wanna thank yeah. for, for, for your sister to bringing you at this and, and getting you uh, an opportunity to raise your family in, a, in an environment where you can thrive more. Now, tell us a little bit about the journey back uh, I know you were a fun-loving guy. You never cared for anything in terms of impressing people. And I shared that joke with you that when all of us were kind of immature and trying to impress the other side, uh, you were always looking for fun. How did you become a doctor even? Like, how did you become to sit down to study the material to even become a doctor? Who pushed you? It's a, it's a good question. Uh... If I go back to my school days, I got, um, I did all my schooling from one school, which is uh, IMCB F84. All those 12 years, um, I studied there. I didn't move anywhere. And I made a lot of friends, but I was always an outdoor sort of guy. It's very hard to contain me at home. I only come home to uh, you, you know, just to eat and then just for the essentials. The rest is I'm outside. But the thing is, my father, um, it's his hard work because he, um, maybe you don't aware or maybe you don't remember. My father used to work a, not from Islamabad. He used to work from Saiwa. And he sent us with our brothers and sisters to Islamabad for studies. I have got 
big age difference with my older siblings and they were my guardians. Um, so they were feeding back to father, this all studies, because our purpose of us to move to Islamabad is our father who wants us to get all well, very well educated and, and, you know, do well in the life. He was a doctor. He was a GP there. He's worked there 50 years and he was a legend. Um, in one small place, he worked there. He never moved, but he moved us and all the struggles he did. Um, that's what motivates us because I'm, we are six brothers. My elder brothers, they couldn't get to medicine. He's, he has the dream that all of it goes to medicine. All of his kids will do medicine. Um, so my elder sister, um, uh, she is a doctor, and then there's another sister's doctor. But he wants a boy. He wants the boys to do well. So although my other brothers, they, they were not bad in studies. They all end up doing um, high masters or, or, you know, accountants and that sort of stuff in an army. And, but it's his dream. He's craving with every one failing, he's craving to at least please one, you know, you, when you see there's six guys failing, you see one fail, two fail, three fail, you see your confidence starts shaking mm -hmm. and you always start questioning, is my decision was right? I want one of my son to be a doctor. Then um, the thing was hard for Asif. He, he got in yeah. and then I got in uh, by the grace of God. It was just, Purely um, for his efforts, but coming back to your question, uh, that was the motivation to see this, to bring that light back into my father's eyes, that I just want to become a doctor. I have absolutely no idea. We know that he lives like a celebrity where he worked because he was the pioneer. He was the cornerstone for medicine in that region. And whenever we go there, visit that place um, in holidays, um, people look at my father like, you know, some sort of film actor or some sort of, everybody knows him and that's, and everybody knows that you're the sons of the doctor. So, although I've never known those people because I, when we moved to Islamabad in 1977, 78, um, I was only three years old. Um, so my elder brother and sister, they have acquaintances or friends there, but I never know any people apart from my relatives there. But that's how it is. Now coming back to the third part, which is the fun loving. I always fun loving. I just do a lot of pranks. I was, I was very active in a way, in, in not in a negative way, but we used to do a lot of pranks and, um, you know, with respect to elders and everything, but play all sort of sports. Um, and when the time comes, I study hard, but I didn't study for phonetically. I only study enough so, so I can keep the scholarship going because that was another thing. I always come in the, because in our school, whoever was in the first five positions get scholarship. And I in, have scholarship always, and that was my extra money. But only study enough to get that scholarship. I'd never try harder. Uh, but the people put it that way in school, in the higher schools or in the college. <laughs> the, my friends used to call me Ustad. Ustad. <laughs> and that's, that explains, that sums up who I am. Yeah, wow. That's, they said you are Ustad. You're a star. And yeah. they, they, they come to me if for whatever problem they have. Because I don't have any friends in school. I always have a big friend um, in the sports areas, also friends in the community. And if they have any problem, um, not like that I fight for them. And I just I never fight in my life, like, you know, for the negative way. But if they want some help somehow, and if they want a solution of a problem, 
they and the and it can be a naughty solution it's not the straightforward solution it's just like for example if one of my patient asked me i'm an, i'm allergic to a cat and my the cat belongs to my girlfriend uh, what should i do i said solution is only 2 dollars night <laughs> just kill the cat <laughs> you'll be fine and that that that's my ustad come came out and that's a oops moment i shouldn't be saying that yeah. but that's that's my ustad coming back that you know what are you worried about just kill yeah. the damn cat <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that that's who i am so um, i so i think that tells a little bit of a hidden genius in there that actually can solve the problem um but also keep the fun of life and not forgetting about that and i think i always uh found that in you you were happy no matter how the circumstances were whether this what you, you had the attitude to get through things with a smile on your face now i um I can't recall many pranks um but is it something that you can share a prank in RMC that maybe you know or remember and it would all of us would would come back and would think about it I can think something with chemistry biochemistry maybe a professor we used to call Alu maybe anything that you remember that was uh done <laughs> I think the the worst prank I've done a lot of pranks but I was more busy outside I didn't see I was never a person chasing girls um I was not into girls I give a damn I basically you you you'd know that yeah I know and, that yeah and, that's, yeah that's what so I'm the thing is <clears throat> so all my focus was on doing this mischief and I do a lot of outside uh because I couldn't do many in the medical college because of my brother and sister Uh-huh. um so i have to be very careful that what i do i don't have big uh, consequences or the flashbacks or the ripple effect come to me um so the biggest which i did is when i joined the rmc you know i i developed this bad habit of smoking um that was i was the pioneer of smokers um you know that's that's the credit goes to me um so I used to smoke and and then I ruined my life with it but um Allah gave me strength to give up and start my life back again but it's all blessings from him but the biggest prank I did is I was a smoker and I have very limited funds and you know you have a dhar with this this guy and whenever you pass that guy he looks at you when are you giving money they're not word saying it but uncle look at you and you look at uncle as oops um you know when are you going to give the money back from the cigarette and i used to bring the cigarettes and and one of our class fellow i don't want to say his name because it's not good and he said give me a cigarette chaudhry you just first day in the morning give me a cigarette and he just end up like in the first few hours i have three or four cigarettes down already and i said i just have to fix this guy and i went back and i had my meeting at the headquarters where my other you know ustad that with me yeah. and i say i'm fed up this guy and what should we do everyone thought and we come up with a plan we said okay we'll get these fire crackers you know this called kalashnikov with all little little pellets um which you you know you just lit it up in the shabrat or something like that and we said why not we put up that pellet one of separate it and put in the cigarette and blow that uh, guy's face <laughs> <laughs> so we what we did is we we tried um so we mastered the technique to put it in place and then we mastered it we applied we tested it on few test guys in in the place around who was free lancers who just want the free cigarettes and we blew few faces and uh, and we knew that it's not dangerous it's enough to burn your mustache uh and or maybe a lip and or maybe when, yeah or maybe the your nose hairs but it's not enough to take you to the hospital so once we tested i said okay now i'm going to fix this guy so I, so it's 10 o'clock and i asked them the girl, guys just come to the library i'll show you a prank and they all came and i said just don't just observe and stay and just pretend you're studying 
and everybody is just look around, you know, that little cubicle way in that library. Yeah. Everyone is sitting in, and normally we don't sit there, and, and the girls <laughs> must be, the girls must be, uh, no idea what these guys are pretending. So this guy came and said, oh, Charlie, give me the cigarette. I said, I'm not going to give you. This is my first and last cigarette. I'm not going to give it to you. So I made him stronger to get urge, more for urge it. More, yeah. uh, urge, urge, come for it, Mike. It's all ready. For it, yeah. So usually it lasts more than half. So I, once I've got the half, I've got a mark put it on there, a cigarette, that once I get close to it, it's going to blast any time. And he's just keep coming, keep coming. And once it got to that point, I said, okay, take it, Mike. You're my best friend. And he take it. <laughs> and he blew his face. He blew his face. Uh, so that, I, I know, I know, Chaudhary, you could, you could pull it off. Not many people can pull it off, but you can do it. He so, could, he, uh, if, if I ask this guy, he still did not get the cigarette from me. Yeah, he, <laughs> <laughs> he probably quit it after that. <laughs> okay, so you are now uh, for 13 years in Australia and Melbourne. 17. 17? Yes. Okay. So I came in 2003. 17 years. Okay, exactly. Thank you. So what do you do here? Uh, what is your job like? Um, I came, I um, went and needs to anesthetic and do my certification in 2007. And then I did a family medicine 10. So I've got dual things. I can do both jobs. But my main job is I work in a rural hospital, which um, population are about 10. It's, it's a reasonable size for Australia because Australia total population is 24 million. So the town where I do the job, I basically work a little bit of as a family physician, mm -hmm. but mainly in theaters. And I work mainly as a retrieval. So if something emergency happens, so I retrieve the guys out from emergency. So I do wire them up and get the package ready for the helicopter to come and pick them up. So that's my main job. So this is very different than what uh, United States work uh, structure is. Um, when you left uh, Pakistan, you did some training. What trainings are those are you could do more than one residency are they something like yes, yes. okay so basically you finish the anesthetic first and then i get to the second one which is the family medicine. and, and um, let me ask you uh, is that uh, something that you desired you didn't like anesthesia before why did you went on to do both was it or you still wanted to learn more what was the reason i think um, anesthesia get me to a point where it was very monotonous. It's just the same, doing gassing people, waking them up, go. Okay. I didn't like ICUs um, because it's very disheartening. and mm -hmm. um, So I never liked that job, which, you know, because I've seen enough damage it's done to me in PIMS. Um, so I tried to get another job, which um, which just give you a bit more freedom where I can, because um, initially I work a bit of an emergency before getting into anesthetic. So I like that part where I can be like an all-rounder. All-rounder, generalist. Yeah. Um, now, question. In Australia, the anesthetists, <clears throat> do they also perform interventional pain management procedures because the, you guys are good at epidurals and other stuff. Is that a field in Australia? Yes, it does exist and it's for the are pain specialists who pain do it. Okay. I can do those things in the rooms to some thing and I've done like epidurals, cortisone injections, but now I do less and less because as the radiology is getting more advanced, you don't need to take risk. Take risk, yeah. Um, and um, but I still do what I know in the so room. You are so very they don't... unique. You're very unique in in the way you are. You are an anesthetist, plus you also a, a family practice physician, and you also do something of uh, maybe a backup emergency medicine retrieval. Uh, yes, that's the assignment. most. Is that is that an emergency medicine coverage like? Like if you were to explain your role as in COVID-19, 
<laughs> did you have any role in covid-19 as a retrieval physician yes we were prepared like where i worked there's not even one case reported but we were all prepared okay. that if something happened if we need to do the airway management because it's a primary hospital sort of thing so we need to retrieve so to retrieve we all prepared um how to do what are the risks and what equipment and you know so far so good so far so good and i can tell that you're liking it so let me ask you are you living the dream that as americans say you go and ask somebody who's really having a good time in his life and a career and you ask him so how is life you say well man living the dream so are you living the dream right now alhamdulillah i'm living the dream mashallah that's wonderful let me ask you something the five years from now would you like to be still in this position or would you like to maybe explore uh, change your work your residence and go somewhere else or you are happy the way things are this question um is very simple because if i go to the my beliefs i believe that i'm nothing but dust i'm a vessel and allah works through me allah will place me where allah likes me to do the job and whenever in a position if i feel in my heart allah puts in your heart then you feel uncomfortable people start annoying you you start annoying with the place you know you get annoyed that why 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 and then you move on that's the time to move on but if your times when allah keep in your heart that you're satisfied you got there's two ways to to say thanks to you there's a body way to say thanks to you and there's a spiritual way to say thanks the material way to say thanks is to give you money that's why organizations pay you money for your service but if you say thank and hug someone that's a spiritual way and in a in a job when you're getting thanks both ways then you don't need to move wow chaudhary you nailed it man i've never had such a good answer for a question like this you know all of us we start looking at very materialistic and superficial things including myself yeah i i really liked california weather i would like to go but the homes are expensive and what not but how you put it that there is a time and a place for you and you will be moved by by the by the by your god by your creator by universal wisdom where you will serve best for the people around you and i think that this is the next level of wisdom <laughs> of faith spirituality and i think maybe you should start taking the place of deepak chopra in australia <laughs> no, i don't know maybe it was deep it was deep <laughs> i i really appreciate it let me ask you one thing what are the road blocks that you see in in your day to day work or whatever you want to achieve um and i want to take this as a um career road blocks financial or family whatever you want to do is there anything that you would rather uh see fixed i know you you you're showing a lot of faith in god and i don't think that you will be like you'll have a long list share with me any road block I think once I got my spiritual pathway all the road blocks were gone. Hmm. They were none whatsoever. Um I was blessed with the uh, the best wife and best mother and she is taking care of home. She, she never worked. She um always look after the kids and and I don't need anything. The home is covered. I'm only there to focus at work. And I don't look at the numbers. Numbers disturb me. Is that's what my accountant says. That when I talk about numbers, you start getting a bit irritable. And I said just please don't discuss numbers with me. Just 
stay keep it to minimum so the roadblocks either comes from your home or it comes from the numbers yeah absolutely what left behind is my spirit and i leave it as a vessel for allah to work through me and that's what i pray first thing in the morning and i say thanks for the last thing at the day keep the things simple i i have to ask you this deep deeper insight into purpose of life why we are here what is our relation to to our god our creator what what was the incidence or reason that actually made you start thinking deep inside you how did that happen i think it was it was a person who changed my life um i met this guy at a friend's place he was a spiritual master he his name was rob um he was a british um sas officer which is and now retired in in australia so he was a special agent special hmm. services group he fought a lot of wars and he changed me in a way that because he was a sufi master he was a master of some kind i don't want to go into details in what kind of master he was but he looked at my eyes and i met him the first time and said you'll be all right you just have to just listen to yourself and and praise the creator and my name is rob and i said i'm meeting him in a muslim place but he was converted muslim is muslim he was um you know he's got a muslim name so, but from there i start searching he put me to a soul searching because the thing is when i was in pakistan all of us do hide behind your mom and dad you can't you don't know who you are yeah. when she when she thrown in the deeper end then you know who you are and that's what i found that god works in a mysterious way he's always give you lessons at time whether you listen or you don't listen his choice is yours everyone is given opportunity to improve or change and then with his he opened me up he said you know your soul still be sleeping your body is growing it doesn't mean that your soul is growing you need to bring the creator back to make that soul your soul is just like a seed you need to nourish it to bring it like strong and grow and that makes sense and and then he obviously have many other um you know taught me many good things but then i did hajj in 2012 and that was my turning point um i was not even ready for hajj i was like any other person who said oh, i will do umrah first and then we turn 60 retire will go for hajj but it's my brother who did everything to go to hajj and i did everything not to go but eventually we went and that was the turning point that's where in the hajj is exercise to tell you what la means that you know when you lie down in two clothes that means you're nothing whether you're a millionaire or whether you are the poorest person on this universe you're nothing but dust you're there you're invited to taste what la means and that's changed my life wow i wish that um this deeper insight into our um into ourselves and connection to creator is something that we all explore and embrace as we grow older because i think that's a a place where you find peace within yourself and everything around you becomes more peaceful do you find yourself that you don't have now the desire to have a lot of material or 
you can forgive people easily now because of what your spiritual um, strengths are. What have you gained out of this? I think I found myself, who I am. And I've got the choice, what I want to be. Um, you're right, when there's no material, there's no ill will. Because you want to give, you don't want to take. And you praise God that he's giving you the hand, your other hand who is giving, not the hand who is taking. And that's what you praise. And you become a vessel. You are a messenger. You just want to spread the good word uh, to help others, uh, but quietly, without telling anyone. It's between you and your God, what you're doing. And and just do good, try not to harm anyone, and, and it's easier than if you kill yourself, your, you know, your inner, you know, your, if you kill your desires or what you say is just, you know, it's ego much easier. And, yeah, ego and, and ego and your, and, and that's much easier. So, so, and easy to forgive and move on with your life. Things are get much easier. Has this change made your professional life better? I can see that it would affect your personal life, uh, your attitude towards your immediate family members, your wife, your kids, uh, must have changed dramatically or significantly improved. How has it changed you as a provider? I think as a provider, it's my life get much easier because I'm no one. I've got limited knowledge given to me, but the rest is is from Allah. Hmm. So I get into very difficult situations because in such a big continent hmm. um, with that resources, you know, I'm the last one. I'm on the. I'm the last one standing in the retrieval line when someone goes into deep trouble. I'm the last one who's there calling for help, and I've got like so many times since my spiritual changes, your spiritual inner gets stronger. My job is get much easier. I don't worry about it. Um, people look at me and they said, well, you are just having fun and taking it easy. It's love to work with you. It was a serious case. And I, I don't want to explain to them because they don't understand. Mm -hmm. There are cases which um, really sweats me. But at that time, which is a minute or two, if you don't do anything, the person will die, you know. At that stage, you just have to close your eyes, which I did. And I just pray that if this person's life is there or has to live longer, work through my hand and save him. Save. Wow. And what that a, person. What a great that person, way to keep ourselves calm. I, that I person, never thought about that this way. Because yeah. that we, person we went to, to. Yeah. Wow. That, you, yeah, that person, as I say, that went to Melbourne and when they found out that time, they said, job very well done. But, and that person met me after and said, you saved my life. I said, no, don't blame me. And he just looked at me and I laughed, he laughed. I don't you know <laughs> well all of us grab try to grab every opportunity to actually be credited be rewarded be labeled as the savior and but but this has given you the the strength to say that you know i'm just a vessel i'm just a just a medium through which a higher power our creator is working wow have we so how you wanna 
He said, let me ask you now, since you have a tremendous amount of faith in your creator, is there any particular group of people that your heart goes out to, that you pray for them, that their situation improves? Share something with us that you, you want to see those people have a better life. I think my heart goes for the poor, hmm. basically. I just want this world. We have plenty. If, we, if a person starts growing vegetables in the backyard and grow with love, the fruit is so much. Whole street would eat from there. Why can't? There's no reason for a person to be going to sleep with a hungry tummy. This, but it all depends on our, what we want. What our, because Allah gives you the chance. Whatever you wish, either you, if you wish for world, you will get world. If you wish for, on, you know, on the day of judgment, you wish for a better life, you'll be given that. But we have to work for it. Mm. Um, if it's up to you what you want. But that's what I always say that. The people who are poor, who have no food, which is half the population, have no water. All the resources are spent on, you know, spend on killing each other. They put in R and D for nuclear bombs and so forth, unnecessary things. All the billionaires, they, all these, conspire, do bad things, um, as if they're thinking that there's too much population in this world. We need to get half of it off from this planet. Um, I don't know what it is, but that's why I never understand that if you have a good intentions, how people can go mm. to bed hungry. Yeah. Well, that's another remarkable or uh, way of elaborating. And I'm thinking about, yeah, he's right. I have a yard that is big enough that if I start thinking about cultivating some fruits and vegetables, yeah, that's true. I won't have to do anything different. Earth has all what it needs. I just need to put seeds in it. So that makes me understand that if, even if we as humans take a step forward to do things that we see can help, there will be divine help to make that a reality. If we have a dream to help people, maybe that divine help will, will come to our rescue. And eventually we will see more prosperity. But people, humans, we have to think about it, right? But we get very selfish. How much money I'm going to leave for my kids? How much money I have in my retirement account? And that's very deep. Okay, now let me ask you something. Um, by the way, it has blown my mind away of how this discussion has gone into a next level of our uh, deeper spirituality and thought. And I've been struggling with, with this concept, of course, not as successfully as yours, of being present in now, more being in now and not worry about what is outside. And one of the authors that I recently read a book was The Power of Now. What do you think now, today, it is happening around us because of the COVID-19? How should we react to it? I think um, we take all the precautions. But I see that the two groups, which is the faith and no faith, is a huge difference. Um, the devil works through you with fear. Wherever there's a fear, there's a devil. Mm. Um, so if you're afraid of something, that's the first sign the devil is attacking. Because if you ask this question, that are we breathing this air or eating food and is that in our hands? No, nothing is in our hand. What we're thinking, nothing is in our hand. Um, so what we worried about? 
if we are not controlling anything, if we're not controlling 20, 21% oxygen and H2O, there the creator is looking after you, so you don't have to be worried. So fear is the biggest weapon of the devil, and that's what it's working. I would pass this message. Don't be afraid. You have the death of a shaheed. If you die of this, we do all proper precautions. I'm not saying that we go against the authorities and what they're saying. Do the best what you can do, because that is your duty to do it. Yeah, because you'll be answerable if you don't do it. But if you do and you still get the the problem and you die, that you're gonna die one day. Anyway, if it's not this, it might be more miserable death from a cancer or, or you'll be, you know, paralyzed for 12 months and, you know, be chucked into a age care. You know, it's God knows better what is better for you. Because if you're not getting anything, there's a reason. If you get something, there's a reason. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the reason, don't say a thing. If you know the reason, say thanks. That's it. You know, that is, takes me to another uh, event or another uh, story I want to share with you. I was today walking in my neighborhood and I saw one of my neighbor who is a physician, a hospitalist in a local Philadelphia hospital. Of course, they were uh, caregivers, health providers for COVID-19 floor patients. Um, he had a test, uh, tested a patient, was negative. Uh, patient was taken off of the isolation. Symptoms were persistent. I'm not sure what happened. They repeated the test. It came positive. The people who were actually not using isolation anymore were exposed to this patient who actually was by mistake or by a false negative test was labeled as negative or was positive. So this guy, along with 10 other nurses, were tested by the hospital and were all positive. By the protocols, they were sent home to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, he said, when I came home, I told my wife and I said, I'm gonna just try to be home and see how I am. But you know what? I found it out now, but I probably was exposed six days before and I'm just gonna go and see. And he uh, did not quarantine himself from his rest of the family. He has young kids and healthy wife. Nobody was really sick or immune compromised. And he said, I just lived my life the way it was. I was home as advised, I did not go out. And I said, uh, did you have any symptoms? He said, I had two days, three days of mild fever. That's it. And then it went away. And I was counting my days to go back to work. And my kids, they got exposed, but nobody had symptoms and I did not test anyone. What's the point? So what you said is, this was not his time. The, the strain or the exposure of the virus that he had, if he had gone afraid, he would have made uh, a big deal out of something maybe he got his family tested and all that but he took a deep breath and he said okay let's see what happens nothing really happened he recovered because he was healthy so i i take a point that take all precautions but don't panic that's what you said right you know don't be afraid don't be fearful yes that's true yeah okay now let's go to a little bit uh a, different uh, topic now we, I'm going to go into. If you were asked to tell us what you know now, do you ever wish you knew when you were younger, maybe 20 years younger? What thing that you know now that you would like a younger yourself know if you were to go back in time and advise yourself? Is there anything that you would tell? Just that spiritual part. 
the it would have my, it would have made my life so easy. That I you know sometimes we try to undo things. Um, things that come natural to us, we try to change it. One of my favorite country singers, his song is what it said it sometimes God's biggest gift is your unanswered prayers. You don't know what is good for you, but the God knows what's good for you. So sometimes we say, God doesn't listen to us. He doesn't see my situation. He doesn't reply. But the creator, the man upstairs is looking and smiling at us that I wish you knew that's not right for you. So that's a, that's a great lesson. Okay. If your kids, by the way, I want to know uh, what is your, your family now? Mashallah, you have wife. How many kids do you have? I've got two daughters, Alhamdulillah. One elder is 17, nearly. And the younger one is nearly 13. Okay. Uh, and what are they so studying? They, um, the, the elder one is in the VC, which is called year 11 or you know, we call FSC sort of thing in Pakistan. So she's studying that and the little one is in, in year seven. Okay. So they are just doing the usual schools and not, not studying anything special. Okay. Um, do they ever ask you uh, about being a physician? Do you ever say, come along for the ride, be a physician, or you would say, don't do it? I think um, I've given them a freedom. I never push or discuss these things, but I think they, they, it's a strange way when people see you happy, they will feel it, you're happy. And once you, someone feels you're happy, they try to find out why you're happy and why we are miserable. I think it's the same thing with my kids. <laughs> once they see me, once they see me, they question it and, and they enjoy that part that much. They, they want to do it as well. And I said, okay, good luck. It's up to you. If you get in, you get in. If you don't get in, but become a good uh, human first. Mm. And then do whatever you want. Leave it to Allah. Uh, if it's in your faith, it'll be good. If it's not, it's not good. So go with the flow. Do your best. Uh, you only can, only can try, but the result is in the hand of Allah. Okay. God bless you. So tell us a little bit about um, one of my listed questions are your exposure to somebody which, which we call famous celebrities of any nature. Where you live, does it, does it ever expose you to some kind of that uh, personalities that are considered high power uh, high prestige people that you have to work with or you had to give anesthesia or medical care to somebody? Um, not really. I don't think so because I work in a rural setup. I've never come across anyone uh, except I'm the celebrity. <laughs> you are. So what is, what, that's, that makes me feel like that's, that's good in a way because you're living the life your dad had. Yes. So, 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 what is the rural life like in Australia? Um, it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful in a way that um, you feel like back home. People want to know you. They want to talk to you. They they you become like a family. Uh, you know, there's a lot of families. So you see their kids themselves and their parents, you know, their grandparents and you know the family and then it's a small um, community. So everybody, even if I don't know anyone, they know me. And um, I do um, exercise in very dark in the morning um, where I just go for my runs and that's people still um, can see me with my color. Recognize. And uh, honk. 
<laughs> yes, they still know that this is the only crazy one who's going with the headlight on. So that's, um, you know, you get the honk and people get the windows down and, hey, doc, what you doing? So they, they say these sort of uh-huh. words and, you know, and people, uh, uh, so it's, it's just like uh, living a dream. I saw some of your pictures, know you. um, or maybe one picture on WhatsApp. Um, a, you said you are an outdoorsy type of person. <laughs> so on weekends when you're not working, what activities do you dig into to enjoy or relax? I always loved sports from the start. I was a very active kid. Um, I played a lot of sports and I had a lot of sports with craziness that I want to be good at. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I came here, I played all sorts of sports. I played like, I'm still playing. I've never stopped playing. So I play cricket, and uh, which is a normal norm. So it's not something... You know, that's out of question. That's going to happen. And it's a, it's a rest. game played in Australia. Yes, yes. So the cricket is very famous, very popular. Then I play, I used to play field hockey. Then, you know, all the indoor games. Um, but my smoking was giving me a lot of trouble in 2010. Hmm. Um, and that's what restricting me. My exercise tolerance get to very, very low to a point I couldn't run very far. And, and then it's just, belief came in. I just quit it um, by just watching a program of uh, the Sufi, Dr. Shvakam. And the way he quit it, he just say it in his program, Zavia. And I look at it and it's very simple. I did the same. I never touched that damn thing again. Um, he said just, Put it in there, he said. I put it in a tree and I just pray to Allah to take it away from me. Take the urge away from me. And before that, I've quit it like the others, tried to quit it for like millions of times, like the, my other colleagues and other friends had. But never be successful. But that's why I gave up. And, and then I decided oh, I'm going to run. Uh, I'm going to start getting active. So I started doing gym, but I'm not an indoor person. So then I start get my focus on running maybe a kilometer without stopping. And I achieved in six months. Then I said, okay, I'll run 5Ks without stopping and achieve in two years. And then eventually I increase it to 10Ks. Eventually I increase it to half marathon. And then I increase it to marathon. And I did it all. Wow. When did you run your marathon? Uh, I ran a lot of practice marathon, but I then run in Melbourne marathon here. Um, but a lot of practice comes behind it. Wow, and, uh, it is. That, then I do a lot of tracking, like a lot of 80Ks, 100Ks, um, where you go out for without sleep. You have to do it. What? In certain Explain amount of time. That explain that 100k and 80k you just walk 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 for walk run walk run whatever you can do it's in mountains in, in mountains and then you camp no no camping no camping wow. you just keep going so how long does it take to complete it usually 16 to 18 hours my God, I've never heard that before. I've heard about it in Japanese uh, culture, in mountain, Japanese mountains. People do that. I think they were training for some kind of thing. So have you encountered a, something wildlife that is interesting during your, these tracks? I think I've, I've, I've seen snakes. A lot of how deadly about, snakes. How about the kangaroos? Kangaroos. Kangaroos, are, they're scared. They're scared the hell out of you because you're you got a headphone on and they suddenly sneak behind you and just pass you and you just get scared. Um, there's plenty and they're quite scary. They're quite big. You have, you have had close encounters with them? Oh, yes, yes. All the time. All the time? Yes. So you said they scare you because they pass by you really close. So they're not scared of people? Mm, they are not scared of people, but if you get into their 
too close and you're not aware, they can be a bit offended. Especially oh. if the if you got the little joy in the pouch, the mom will come after you. And if the oh, dad is uh, dad dad is in love with mom, the dad will come in front. So <laughs> go for a run. Okay. And then you have to then you have to go around the tree. Poppy head, you come this way, you go the other way. <laughs> so um, in um, in America, to get closer to wildlife other than deers, um, in my backyard I would see deers. And, but no other animal. But in, if you go to uh, a national park, you can see more wildlife, including um, ox and I'm forgetting the big giant buffaloes that uh, um, bisons, bisons that yes. you can you can see there. And, uh, so are are kangaroos like in your backyards in uh, Australia, or they are also in national parks where it's secluded i think if it all dependent they don't come very close to very heavily populated cities like in melbourne they don't but as you go in melbourne outer peripheries where they come to a bushland hmm. they will come in rural areas they are everywhere they are everywhere so, so everywhere. do you ever see in your backyard uh, because you said you live in a rural area do you see yes. that in your backyard yes is there any disease associated with them like we in america we have like tick-borne diseases, and they are highly associated with deers. Uh, not really. Kangaroos, um, there's no such specific disease. Lyme disease type of thing. There doesn't exist no, anything no. like that. Okay. Okay, very interesting. I wish, uh, I would like to see a picture or two of, uh, of kangaroos around you. If you ever catch one, just send me. Yeah, that's for sure. I'll send you a graph. Um, okay. So tell me, if there has been a place where you have vacationed and you want to, if somebody says, well, you got a chance, where would you say, take me back there? I just love that place. You just give me any mountain. That's my place. I'll just go and disappear there. Yeah. That's it. That's you know, it. mountains are, are lovely. I fell in love with Grand Tetons. I went there last year for a Yellowstone National Park in Grand Teton the majestic majesty that you see from mountains and being close to them it's unexplainable i could not i i i thought that yellowstone national park is beautiful especially the the natural springs and um the hot water springs but the majesty of mountains is amazing so do you ever have to um can you like uh, have the gear to climb the mountains too? Like I, uh, I yes, I, I, yeah, I do, I do. I've got all the gear, yeah. and I um, who gives do you that. company in your family? Does your family join you? Uh, no, it's usually the you know the crazy-minded someone like me who wants to share that adventure, oh. and um, it's it's rare. But I usually go on my own. I don't want any company. Yeah. Um, my own. So, so that's, that's your moment of peace and also adventure together. It gives you some adrenaline and also some peace at the same time. That's the peak of uh, both the, experiences. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you had a, one month of no limits, no limits of... You have one month vacation, free access to travel anywhere in the world, an unlimited budget. How would you spend those days? We can make it a smaller seven day if you want to be more splendid. And what I'll do is I'll just, I'll just get the off-road bike, get my tent, and just go around the northern areas. Where the day ends, I'll camp. Where the day starts, I'll move. So just go around and explore so this is you're talking about northern australia no northern pakistan northern pakistan yeah. wow you you had unlimited budget you could travel anywhere in the world you will go to northern pakistan and you yes. spend a, a month there and you will just move on camp wherever yes yes wow that is something okay um Okay, tell me one thing, as I have many stories like this, 
what is your oops moment? A moment that you did a mistake that your wife would never forget. And she would tell you when you're sitting with your friends and you're being smart. And she's like, okay, this guy has done this too. So just be careful. And they made an oops moment. <laughs> <laughs> There's one in particular. Um, because the construction here in the houses, as you know, is not like back home. So we used to live in a single story house. And this heating unit is up in the roof. Mm-hmm. And one, one day it stopped working. And I think maybe a you know, fuse burned out or something. So we called the, Electric. the handyman. He, handyman. So he came, he'd gone through the manhole up there in the roof. And he turned it on. And I said, magic. He said, I said, why bother you again? You tell me where to turn it on. And he said, oh, come up. So he get me up the ladder. I just poke my head through the, the, the manhole and I look at and he said, oh, that's on the wall. That's the unit. That's the button. If it happens, flick it up. I said, okay, easy. So it happened again. <laughs> Guess what? Because on there, you only have to walk on the planks. There's no, no the support cardboard. elsewhere. There's no support <laughs> whatsoever. So I jump up. I said, I'll, I'll just go. And uh, my wife said, the heating is not working. I said, oh, I know how to do it. Easy done. <laughs> Here comes the macho man. Went up the, the ladder, opened the manhole, stand up. First step, no problem. Second step, I came down with the 100-year-old cladding. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> that's funny. I, so I fell with the, you know, I fell on the ladder and then onto the, onto the sofa under and, and, and there's a hundred tons of, uh, you know, hundred year old cladding on my head. And my kids were laughing and my wife was laughing. <laughs> and uh, I create a, a big hole in the roof. A big hole in the roof. Wow, man. Um, this happens. I will tell you, since you shared yours, I will tell you so that it's equal. Our first vacation, I went, um, we moved to New York City. I was doing my residency after two, three months of that, I was like, I want to take a vacation. And it was our kind of honeymoon too, together. So I uh, decided to go to Grand Canyons and Las Vegas. Um, and I was, um, I was not driving in New York. I had subways, right? So I really, I'm not a good driver by any standards at that time in New York, in America. But you could still get an international license to rent a car. So I still had an international license, Pakistani license. So I rented a car. And uh, we were on the strip in uh, Vegas. Uh, drove and I could see everything. So I was like, you know, I felt comfortable. It was not. But then I, something happened. I took a turn and I came back. And there was a highway I had to take. And I was driving us on the opposite okay. side of the oh, it, was, oh, it was late at night. And by the time we realized that I was driving on the wrong side of the traffic, there was a huge truck coming in front of it. Oh. Turn it off. And whenever I say something about driving or things, every she reminds me <laughs> that this is what I did. I almost got ourselves killed within the first three months of our uh, on our so, first vacation and three months so, so. of our wedding, so of our life. So and, okay. and the same thing. My wife says that if you need something done up. In the roof, you know, my husband's <laughs> ready. He knows everything about the roof. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, are you, cons- this is my last question. Um, I'll wrap it up. What do your kids love about you? you, you it sounds like you are a pretty cool dad. Um, what do they like the most about you? Um, just crazy as them. <laughs> just <laughs> j- jump, jump around with them, muck around with them. And just um, do um, so they feel that they are with a friend. They can share. Yeah. Wow. So, so the, the, the traditional gap between a daughter and a father, you have kind of eliminated that and kept them very close and confident so that they can share anything with you as a father, as a friend. Mm, that's I'm trying. The that's I'm trying. trying. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. Um, okay, well, it's, this has been a player. I would ask you if somebody wants to come and visit 
Australia, what is a piece of advice that you would tell Pakistanis not to do so that you don't get more embarrassed by Pakistanis doing some crazy stuff when they come to Australia? I think that the most craziest stuff they do is they convert rupees to dollars. <laughs> Every time I used to do that too for like up to by the time I didn't become an attending, I used to convert everything. That's the biggest That's mistake. The biggest. The... <laughs> That's a good advice to make your life easier, right? That's true. That's, a, that's pain, man. That's agony. To yeah. go through that, you know, one time... You say I... that, you look at him, you say, this bread here, $2, man, that is 200 rupees, and 200 rupees, I'll have three loaves of bread back then. <laughs> yeah. Why am I paying that much here? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm just, I'm just, um, my one of my acquaintances is a friend, like a school guy, which I know from school. He bought a house, and his wife said, "Why we should have to pay eight crore for this house?" I said, <laughs> yeah. Eight crore. Eight crore. <laughs> that's good, man. That's good advice. Okay, Adnan, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for sharing Thank you. your your uh, wisdom with us. I would say, you know. And I, and I don't, I, I, I think you have um, shared things that nobody would expect. And I uh, want to thank you for giving us this, uh, this time and uh, look forward to staying in touch. I, I've never been to Australia, but I, I think your love will, uh, inshallah, pull me one day to come and visit. Inshallah. 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 And, inshallah. And, and inshallah, when the corona is when America is free of Corona, you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. Thank you very much, Farhan. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, Doing a great uh, job.